Welcome to FinTech Talents Embedded Finance North America 2021. I'm Bradley Limer, co-founder of Unconventional Ventures and co-author of a new book about better banking business models called Beyond Good. I hope you enjoyed the initial keynotes this morning because in this session, we're going to talk about embedded finance within the context of what it means outside of financial institutions as well to be deployed by non-financial entities like retailers and customer facing industries. We want to discuss what this means for banks, what this means for everybody in the industry that touches money. And that's pretty much all of us. So can embedded finance offer new revenue opportunities and new business models for incumbents who will best serve the banking needs of customers in the future? How are we going to do that? So within that context, I want to dive in and introduce the two panelists that we have today. Uh, let's start with you, Marcelo. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you do and about Skip the Dishes? Hello, everyone. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm Marcelo Dubiel. I'm a product manager for the Courier Experience and our Courier mobile application. Uh, this summer, the business operates in five countries uh, and provides the means for our independently contracted couriers to complete deliveries for our customers. So, you know, what is Skip the Dishes? Skip the Dishes is a three-sided marketplace offering Canada's widest selection of online ordering from restaurants and recently other verticals such as grocery and convenience store items. Skip the Dishes was founded in the prairies and now has over 30,000 restaurant partners and facilitates thousands of deliveries a day made by independently contracted couriers. Skip is a part of a larger family of companies listed as uh, JustEatTakeaway.com and the area of work that I work in as mentioned before, was our courier space, which is also considered our logistics space in the company. And Jill, can you uh, tell us a little bit about selling? Sure, thank you, Bradley. Hello, everyone. Uh, delighted to be here. My name is uh, Jill Baratius. Uh, I'm uh, head of the retail banking team here at Selend. We are an industry research and advisory firm focused exclusively on financial services technology. So we work with banks and uh, technology service providers uh, to, to help them understand what's what's happening, the change that's happening in, in, in the space of technology and then how they can best navigate that change. Uh, before joining Salent, uh, which was almost over a decade ago now, um, I was with uh, Oliver Wyman, so long career in uh, advisory and consulting services. Uh, delighted to be here. Looking forward to the conversation. Very good. And uh, as a former client of, of both, uh, Jill, I will tell you that uh, Selent knows what they're talking about. So when we get into this study in a minute, uh, certainly pay attention. Um, so, so when we think about the financial services landscape today, we're, we're seeing more examples of how banking as a function has started to disappear. Uh, this has been driven by this sort of record crazy pace of venture funded fintech startups but also by large technology firms, payment providers, retailers themselves, and so many diff different types of players that are embedding different aspects of banking into another function or feature of their business model and their value proposition. You know, banking itself as it disappears is simply becoming part of a workflow for someone else. So one could imagine where most every aspect of traditional banking could simply be a invisible or less forward feature of another company or industry service experience. So, so let's let's get into that and, and let's get into the definition. Uh, Gilles, let's talk about that recent report I mentioned that you did on embedded banking with Stephen Greer. And, and what do these new models mean for your, your banking clients and for the financial services industry? Um, how do you define embedded banking, embedded finance? Yeah, thank you, Bradley. Um, so th there's no question, I think, as you said, that the financial services ecosystem is definitely opening up. And I think banks are trying to figure, figure out what their new role is and what, what is the, the place for them in that ecosystem. And, and the way they go about it is kind of really thinking along two dimensions. So at, at the heart of it is really is who curates customer experience. Uh, so one option is for banks uh, who you know very much grew up traditionally uh, making products and selling them through their own channels increasingly digital of course uh, thinking you know what other products could they sell so what they're doing is they're partnering with fintechs they're, they're you know they're, they're collaborating with others to, to incorporate the products that they may not necessarily have themselves into their their arsenal 
and so go with other financial products to their customers. Some of them are even looking at um, Asia, um, some of the super apps that have emerged and saying, you know, is there a role for us that we could play there? Could we actually go beyond finance and start offering, getting into, I don't know, curating e-commerce or facilitating some sort of uh, becoming a place where customers go for much more than just financial products. They come for advice, they come for, for additional services. Um, agriculture seems to be one of those sectors where quite a few banks have tried to position themselves as the go-to places for you know, much more than just getting a loan. It's, it's you know, for weather advice, for when to plant seeds and, and, and everything else. So that's kind of the product dimension, but you know, banks are trying to curate that experience themselves and thinking, you know, what is it that they and their customers would like to see from them? The alternative, of course, is to open up and open up the doors into and start providing those those banking products to others. And one option is to simply allow customers to, to access the data that they have, initiate payments from their accounts through third parties, which is typically known as what's known as open banking. Uh, you hear that term quite often mentioned, particularly in the context of what we're talking about in here. But embedded finance takes that one step further. For us, embedded finance really is, is discover and, and, and the ability to buy and obtain the new product through a third party curated experience. So it's, it's really important here that that, that third party is non-bank, right? So it's uh, so they don't necessarily have a banking license. So that means you know, banks still have a role to play potentially by, by supporting them with those regulatory requirements. Uh, but you know, that notion of buying something through a non-bank uh, third party is not necessarily new. I mean, we're all familiar with going to, um, to an auto dealer and getting a, I mean, car insurance, for example, right? It's, uh, or, or even arranging financing through them. Uh, what's different now, I think, is that a lot of that is now happening through digital channels. Right? So this is this is all, all all digital. But one thing where you know we particularly, I think, for us, it's really important to, to highlight that it's this notion of being able to obtain a new product because we've seen in the market, and you know, one of the reasons why we actually dived into writing this report is to try and kind of under, really understand what embedded finance is because so we, we've seen people. Kind of defining embedded finance really loosely, and you know, one of the famous examples is um, the familiar Uber experience. You know, we all we all use this, right? It's it's very easy. You get into the car, you get out. You know, the payment happens magically, and and people use that as embedded finance. It's it's a great example of embedded payments of of payments being kind of magically disappearing, but at the heart of it, it's it's a card on file, right? And, you know, as a customer, I. I, ha I already had a card issued by my bank and I just put it uh, with Uber, just like I put it with um, Amazon, with Netflix, with, with anyone else. And so from a bank point of view and from even provider's point of view, it's it's not that different. It's just basically being able to store that card and, and then to enable that experience. From a customer's point of view, it's, it's different and it's a very nice experience, of course. But so the, the reason I think for us that definition is, it matters is, is because I think fundamentally it's the new set of capabilities that are required to deliver embedded finance like experiences. Well, and then you, you differentiate in the report um, the sort of different paths to get there. And you talk about embedded banking in terms of full stack banking as a service platform, cards and payments, which you've alluded to with the Uber uh, example, uh, bank software vendors. Can you talk about the differences in terms of those that are sort of offering the capabilities of offering embedded finance and maybe give us some examples uh, of, of each type. Sure. So um, it's, it's interesting you mentioned banking as a service. That's that's another term which uh, quite often we see people use interchangeably banking as a service and embedded finance uh, as this two, you know, one and the same thing. For us, embedded finance is the what. Banking as a service is quite often the how. Not always, but quite often it's it's the how, right? And banking as a service is, you know, um, obviously we're, we're no different in, in how the rest of the industry sees it. It's um, it's it's comprised of uh, a number of layers. You know, there's there's an API and orchestration layer. There's this as a service layer, which basically takes products and capabilities and disaggregates them into a kind of modular way that that you can combine and then deliver it as as a service to whoever needs that. And then at the heart of it, you have a modern core or flexible core, core, core ledger, and then you have um, the banking license. And, and those components can be provided either by the same player or 
or, or sometimes by, by different types of players. And I think that the regulatory license versus the tech stack is, is quite often a, a neat separation. So platforms that come to the market that, that bring everything together, um, good examples are Rails Bank, Solaris Bank here in Europe, uh, Synapse is, 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 is a vendor that, um, you know, they, they partner with a uh, World Bank and, and they, you know, they, they, they go together as a package that, that have regulatory component and the and technology component. Um, and, and again, even even there, sort of, you know, there are, there are nuances and differences. Uh, but by and large, those types of platforms, they tend to go position themselves as banking as a service, full platform, and go after those non-bank customers and then the brands that, that might want to embed those financial products into, into their offerings. At the other end of the spectrum, you have um, you know banks themselves saying, well, we've got the license. We might actually want to have maybe a, a better technology capability. So there are vendors out there that actually can provide you with that. You know, so you know, the more traditional players like FIS, Finastra, and, and others, uh, as well as, you know, 10X, Mambo, you know, those, uh, anyone with kind of core, core banking platform that, that is modern, flexible, and capable of, of delivering that. And then in, in the middle, you have players that uh, may bring just enough uh, of that regulatory license uh, and, and maybe a real sort of specialist in delivering a, a segment of that, a specific capability, and cards as a service is a perfect example here. You know, the likes of Marketa and, and, and the Galileo, now part of Sophia, are, are great examples of that. Where you know they focus on some some very specific capabilities, and where needed, work with banks uh, to get bin, license, bin, bin sponsorship and licenses to, to to bring that in there as well. But you know, the, it's it's been a, obviously yeah. that was in the detail, and and the thing is that. That space is so complex and, and, and moving so fast that uh, you know, the players always evolve. They always add more to their offering. So, for for for, a, for an analyst, it's very difficult to, to categorize them and then put them into buckets, as, as tempting as it is for us to do so. Well, and, and and think about all those you know graphics that are on those venture uh, capital uh, lists of all those types of services, and they just continue to grow and grow and grow. And there's more and more unicorns in each one of those spaces. And Marketa here in the Bay Area is a great example of that. Um, so let's let's jump back to the sort of non-banking view of this embedded finance and talk about the story of empowerment and convenience and alignment with customer goals. So Marcelo, can can you talk about sort of this embedded finance and explain how Skip the Dishes is leveraging companies like Stripe and TrueLink and other providers as part of your value proposition? <clears throat> yeah, for sure. So I, I think I'm going to echo a, a lot of what Jill's saying um, uh, when I'm discussing this, but I look at embedded finance as a strategy to, to, to build value added products or services within my company's ecosystem that either provide a level of convenience or protection to our user base. In particular, uh, as I mentioned, I'm working with our, our couriers, so we'll keep that in context, uh, our independently contracted couriers. So one example of how we've kind of leveraged uh, an embedded finance service in our ecosystem is our fast cash product. So this is a service that allows our independently contracted couriers in Canada to withdraw their earnings at any time outside of being on a shift. So this product targets the convenience factor and taps into the real time payments by empowering uh, our, our users um, to allow them to have self-directed on-demand cash flow. We built this product in a partnership with, uh, as you mentioned, with payment provider Stripe, uh, which also does our, our basic, our consumer facing uh, uh, processing, uh, payment processing. The product that we built specifically leverages Visa Direct's real-time fund disbursement capability and allows us to capture a large portion of our user base, existing user base, without requiring any type, any type of special cards or complicated signup process. Um, our users, in this case, with that product, our users were able to basically use their existing bank accounts and sign up within minutes once we launched the product. Uh, it, it, was, it was quite fantastic. Um, another example uh, where we're seeing embedded finance or the concept of embedded finance, at least in my view as a product manager, uh, is, is using them in finance products. Um, sorry, <clears throat> an example of this is some of our products that we've had uh, in Europe with uh, insurance providers such as Zago. So in this case, we're providing vehicle insurance uh, for our couriers during, or for the couriers on the network during their shifts through integrations with partners such as Zago. And it's a pay-as-you-go type of model where we have broad coverage, uh, allowing all of our uh, people on the road delivering food to, to be taken care of on an insurance basis. Um, 
So in my view, like uh, services like that also kind of fit into embedded finance from my perspective, because at the end of the day, what we are uh, really bringing is a value added aspect to our, to our independently contracted career pools. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to win their time. We're trying to ensure that we're the preferred network to work with. And these, both of these types of products help us achieve that type of goal uh, by providing real time uh, services. Well, I, I love this fast cash uh, example that Visa and your other partners sort of enable. Uh, more of these sort of banking uh, services are becoming more like utility. Like you said, they're, they're kind of getting out of the way so that you could start building that value. Because you can, compared to you know five or 10 years ago, you could drop a line of code and say, okay, well now you could do savings and investments and onboarding and identity and all the rest. And you could offer credit and you could offer so many different things within your workflow and banking and the banking service just sort of fades into the background. Um, and we talked about you know new business models evolving from super apps in China and Southeast Asia, from Ant Group and Gojek and Tencent and Grab. And they're going very, very broad in terms of what they're offering to consumers and small businesses because they combine this sort of day-to-day -day, you know, life journey and banking needs and just get out of the way. Um, so, so going back to sort of the, the banking industry, one of the most interesting components that you kind of have seen is this journey that we've had of unbundling, rebundling, rearranging banking services over the past 10 to 15 years. And all of these things have now been enabled in terms of, you know, competition in some ways to what banks and incumbents offer today. And as we look at new sources of revenue, as we see very fast moving banks getting more involved in offering these types of services to compete with technology providers and startups, um, let, let's talk about that way. You know. Uh, Gilles, can you walk us through maybe some of those five primary ways you've identified in the report to help sort of demystify all of this and the opportunities that are around it? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Bradley. Uh, so for, for banks, and I, uh, so I guess this because as we discussed, for banks, really, it's an opportunity to distribute their products through non-traditional channels, right? Through partners, through through different um, brands, different different players. And so the question is then, how, how do you do that? Um, so one option is, um, again, you know, we talked about cards as a service and being able to issue a card on the fly by, by a company. So, we, you know, we talked about Uber experience where a customer just stores the card with Uber. But the, the, the opposite of that is Uber issuing cards to their drivers so that they could pay and get paid much quicker through you know, the prepaid card experience. To me, that's a perfect example of um, of what um, you know what what embedded finance is, um, and and to enable that sort of experience, you need a cards as a service player provider, and then you need a you need a bank to to support with in sponsorship with with a banking license. So so there are banks, particularly in the U.S., that that kind of part of their business model is to cater to those types of experiences and support a lot of these. Um, non-bank card issuing experience, but also even entire fintech propositions. Um, for example, in, in, in Europe, we have a different kind of licensing system, but in the US, um, a lot of players, fintechs that have emerged, so-called neobanks, they don't have banking licenses themselves, the likes of Chime and, and many others. And so they work with partners and there's there's a bank underneath that. So so there's an opportunity for that bank to play, you know, take part in the economics and, and part of that success story of a player like Chime. To, to, to share that. Um, the other example is um, quite, quite often we talk about um, uh, co-branded cards, right? Again, it's a typical example where you go to market with a partner, and but historically those those were quite flanky experiences. You know, it's typically offline. You know, by the time you sign up for that, um, you know, it's so no, nobody kind of would, would typically see that as an embedded finance example. But you can make that embedded finance and make it really nice and easy to, to sign up. And that's what Wells Fargo did, for example. So they they offer to their co-branded credit card partners, they offer a series of SDK and, and APIs that essentially allow them to embed that credit card application, co-branded credit card application right in the flow. So you might be on a hotel site and trying to book a hotel, realize actually you wouldn't mind getting a co-branded card from that uh, partner um, and, and and click the button and you know you can take, you can sort of 
create that application form, which then gets approved automatically. And, um, and, and you can finish that transaction. You can finish booking that you know, right there and then you know, with, with this newly issued, issued approved credit card. So that's, that's a very different experience because you've now completed getting a new financial product right within that third party, third party ecosystem. Um, then there's a whole bunch of banks. Um, quite a few of them are in Europe, uh, but also all over the world, really, that um, decided that they would like to have, um, because they already have a license, you know, can we have also a platform that, that we could sell to, to others? So it's basically going with technology and the license component. I mentioned Solaris Bank, uh, Starling Bank is another one. Uh, some of the larger banks, uh, Westpac in Australia, for example, decided that they would like to partner with, uh, with a technology provider called 10X, um, and they built um, a standalone banking as a service offering. So they, have, uh, you know, Afterpay is one of their clients in Australia that uh, that is now offering kind of building embedded finance solutions. Societe Generale in France uh, decided that they would buy one of the banking as a service players, Trezor, in the market. And again, they, they're using them now to, to develop those, those offerings. The final example, I suppose, I'd, I'd like to bring in, um, which is really sort of it's, it's two somewhat slightly different, but with very similar ways in terms of it's, it's really sort of banks partnering with uh, technology giants to, to really kind of collaborate and co-create um, an experience that, um, that, that, would be, that would be different and unique to the market. So one example is Google Plex, right? So it's Google offering uh, an account in partnership with, at the moment, it's 11 financial institutions. You know, there are technology players uh, supporting, supporting that as well. So those 11 institutions, and, and they can be, you know, the largest banks like Citi, but also relatively small banks like Seattle Bank. Uh, all of them can take part now of this Google, Google Plex experience and, and offer this through a player like Google to uh, an end consumer. So it's B2B to B to C type experience. And the last example I would bring is, um, again, it's players like City, like Goldman, like, like other, a few, few others, Barclays, working with Stripe to build out Stripe Treasury. And Stripe Treasury, in case you're not familiar with that example, is basically the idea is that it would be an offering to marketplace customers of Stripe. So companies like Shopify, which in turn have other businesses, other business customers that uh, they come to Shopify for, 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 for certain things. So in this case, to build out their own e-commerce presence, realize they actually might need a bank account because they might be a brand new business starting up. Uh, so so they, they might want to open a bank account and can get that right there and then through Stripe Treasury type experience, which is powered by a number of banks. So, so that is sort of, I think for, for us, that's... Um, that's kind of that's quite a different model from being a bin sponsor to, to, to support fintechs because it, you know, you, you need to be comfortable playing with the likes of Google and, and others uh, to, to support you know their propositions, um, you know, given everything that uh, comes with data sharing and, and everything else, you know, this kind of the, the perennial question of who owns the customer, etc. Right? So, so, so I think that's that the, these are the questions that banks have to ask themselves so how comfortable they are with that sort of strategy and then you know who are those partners that, that are willing to they're willing to play with well, I think it's it's going to be continuing like to be interesting to see how incumbents do respond I think the the smartest ones uh, are very active in the space both investing and partnering um, we know that it's going to continue to evolve we know that you know large platforms, to your point, like Google and Amazon and Apple and Facebook, but other geographies we're seeing in India, WhatsApp and Paytm and PhonePay in Latin America, we're seeing Mobile and NewBank explode in terms of their type of offerings in Rappi and others. Um, when you combine the functionality of the specific business models, like something like Skip the Dishes, Marcelo, and consider these broader super apps that deliver you know, a huge marketplace of services, that align more with our, as a consumer in small business, our sort of day-to-day -day activities. Can you imagine, you know, providing to your couriers and providing to your uh, restaurant partners and your merchant partners other types of services? You mentioned insurance. Um, can you foresee anything like credit or anything else? Like, what what does insurance to a courier look like? What do you help them with? Can you talk about that? Yeah. <clears throat> So I think I think 
just echoing some of the stuff that Jill has mentioned, it, it's really about embedding the product in the workflow. Like you guys are talking about a lot, of, a lot about the workflow of of, uh, of our of, of a specific uh, consumer facing or, or, or publicly facing product. Now, what I imagine is is adding in new uh, levels of convenience for our couriers, um, where if you, for example, because we're when we're using the Visa, uh, we're using because we're using Visa Direct in this in our fast cash product. You know, we, we don't have access to 100 percent of our uh, of our careers. They don't 100 not 100 percent of our careers have access to the service. Now, what I would like to do, and I would as a product manager, I would like to give that to them by embedding new ways to to sign up for cards within our application, making it so easy and so seamless that if they want to get onto the fast cash service, they can do it within minutes. Now, that that's something I would love to do as a product manager. Um, I, I, you know, I'd be looking to leverage an embedded finance, an, an additional embedded finance product in my in my application. Um, when it comes to insurance, I think we we've kind of, you know, in Europe uh, versus North America, they're a little bit ahead on it, um, where we're providing that service uh, as a means to to you know protect our user base, and we want to make sure that everyone is you know safe on the road and and also has um, a quality of life that you know everyone can 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 align with. And providing insurance on a real-time basis is something that the career doesn't even see. So a lot of this, like the way that these processes work, is um, you know we're we're not impeding or making it complicated for our user base. We want to make sure that when we build these things, they don't even they sign up once and they don't even know they don't even notice it anymore until they have to make a claim. So you know the way I see it happening is that you know it, it, there's geo geographic uh, geographical challenges. Um, particularly in Canada, uh, the way that insurance works is a provincial basis. Um, but I think that the next step is, is to really look at health insurance. So providing uh, on like on shift health insurance products um, so that we, you know, we're covering that aspect uh, of the couriers uh, work, work life uh, during, during set, like during their shifts. Um, and, and I think like that's, that's somewhere where it's going to go, but I also see us leveraging uh, some of the technology and the learnings that we have from from these existing products, and and trying to transfer them to other to our merchants, so our restaurant partners, and trying to build out products and innovations for them um, as well. And and I think that that's going to be a big big kind of flip because right now it, it's uh, I think the the. the the process of paying out our restaurant partners is, is a little bit complex um, because of, you know, we have different uh, cancellations and, and food uh, remakes and there's a bunch of different flows that, that kind of make it a little bit more of a challenge um, to, to kind of offer some real time uh, access to cash type of uh, workflows. But I think that that's the next challenge ahead of us is, is trying to look at how do we offer it to all of our partners and, and not just the courier pools, but, but uh, the merchants as well. And yeah, if I can I, just I, jump I, in here, go, go ahead, that's, that's yeah, I think sure. where, 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 the, where the innovation will happen, right? It's by driven by players like uh, like, like your company, Marcelo, because you, you're talking about um, now insurance on shift, right? You know, this is a lot of insurance carriers today are not, uh, that's not how they sell insurance. That's not how they think about their product. Right? And I think that's that's the most interesting aspect of it is, you know, making it easy to apply for a credit card is, uh, is, is, is one thing is actually coming up with something that that is completely different experience uh, the, the way to experience financial service for the customer is, is is completely different and that's really the power i think of embedded finance uh, and, and and has serious implications for banks and their, their own capabilities and how flexible they need to be both in terms of technology but also in terms of their own thinking about this I, i'd like to just touch on that if if, if i can here um the approach we took by partnering with Stripe and Visa was a very effective strategy. Now, in, in that we were sharing some of the financial risk as well as we were spreading the cost out of the technology development, which is big. You know, we, you know, we have finite resources as a team. We have a lot of stuff to do in a year. Um, so in a, a good example of this, we leveraged Stripe's identity verification tooling uh, to, to protect our business and, and to protect the cash flow uh, of, of, of the service. Um, that's something that we would have taken us months to develop in-house um, where, you know, a simple, like you, men, you mentioned, uh, these, these banking as a service. So they, you know, they have other tooling, Stripe has tooling that they offer, which makes it extremely convenient for um, uh, application team like myself, um, where it, it's really easy for our engineers to integrate with. 
and we're taking advantage of complex systems that are outside of our ecosystem. So that really helps with reducing the scope of work and the time that it takes to build these products. So it makes it a lot more uh, tangible, kind of feasible to get them out the door. Um, and, and it really makes the appetite, uh, there's more of an appetite with, with product managers to try and pursue these types of uh, innovations. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think in general, it, it basically opens up the floodgates for innovation and partnering. And what I look at as embedded finance becoming more ambient, becoming sort of more pervasive is that we have a more inclusive business model that enables, you know, every type of service to kind of flow across the system where one day Skip the Dishes might be offering insurance services into its marketplace of retailers and restaurants that you partner with. Or it could be that, you know, you offer credit through a provider when <clears throat> restaurants need it. Uh, and this idea that insurance and other things can be on demand is a very, very different model than what we had seen in the past decades. So I think if anything, more people will have access and more people will have more optimization of their finances. Um, again, <laughs> embedded finance, snippet of code, a set of rails, a piece of infrastructure, a workflow for risk and a conduit for other services. This race to get more efficient creates this place where the real value of banking becomes less obvious because it's part of other people's business model. And I think that, if anything, is actually a good thing. Um, Gilles, where do you think we could take those applications from those third parties embedding banking experiences? Can, can we see embedded banking really open up to a more stronger industry in the end, a more inclusive industry? What, what are your thoughts on that? Um, definitely on more inclusive, I think, um, you know, where, where and how the, these, these fintechs and neobanks uh, have been able to thrive is by carving out a segment that they really wanted to go after and, and target their proposition very sp specifically at that segment, whether it's underserved customers, maybe maybe specific minorities, LBGD or LGBT or, or, or you know, black communities. So being, being able to serve them through very tailored offerings is, is something that, um, you know, again, these powerful technology platforms are enabling to just to support. Um, you know, there's, there's no question that I think the business model is going to continue to evolve. And I think what one of the, I think you're talking about potentially kind of redefining the industry. If, if those industry boundaries are starting to blur, you know, there's, there's going to be an interest, interesting challenge for the regulators. I think so far we've been able to kind of demarcate that um, who provides the license, who provides the services and be, be clear about that. But I think clearly we, we've seen the, you know, when, when Facebook tried to get into you know, with, with the Libra project initially, you know, the kind of regulatory response that that, that, that caused, um, I think that dialogue with the regulators will have to continue. And so from our point of view, I think, you know, we, we, we're not certainly, we don't see that traditional business, traditional banking model is uh, is going to disappear overnight. I think, you know, many banks will continue to sell what they have, you know, through traditional channels. But, you know, there's, there's no question that um, it, it is changing. You know, these are new opportunities that I think banks uh, can and should uh, consider, you know, partnering with others and, uh, and, and leveraging those opportunities. Absolutely agree. Marcelo, any final thoughts on this in terms of broadening financial inclusion and just how you see the market forming in the future? Yeah, I think I think we've touched on a lot of the, the, the way that I think of it. And I, I really do think it's it's bringing it it's bringing these products and deconstructing them so they're so easy to use for, for anybody and bringing it to your, your cell phone, obviously, bringing it to the mobile application world without, you know, um, I guess from a bank perspective, without having to develop more products. So, you know, your reach is, is going to be deeper into, into people's lives. Um, you're going to reach people who don't even necessarily maybe bank with you, but you're using a service that goes through your bank. So now you have uh, technically new customers, right? You're, you're increasing your customer base. You're um, potentially increasing new revenue streams. For example, with fast cash in our case, it's a, it's a brand new revenue stream that didn't exist uh, pre 2021. So, um, yeah, I think that in general, there's going to be a lot of creativity, uh, especially as, as these these companies mature their their platforms to making the APIs easy to access and, and standard uh, protocols for for transferring the information and data that's needed, and and also just uh, I think strengthening partnerships I think is a huge thing 
So you're going to become more integrated as partners um, and they're going to be long lasting relationships. Yeah, I can't, can't agree more. Um, I just want to thank you, Marcelo, and you, uh, Gilles, for joining us. Um, for more information about the report at Celent, C-E-L-E-N-T dot com, certainly reach out uh, also to skipthedishes.com. Um, thank you all for joining us at Fintech Talents today in defining where embedded banking is going. The next session is a great panel where they're going to talk about the latest technologies behind the veil of banking. Uh, look out for Mary Wisniewski's session where she talks to Amazon and Verizon about how everyone's becoming a fintech. And please stay tuned later for my partner Theo Lau's keynote this afternoon on the connection between embedded finance and financial inclusion. Have a great rest of the conference, everyone. Thanks for coming.